Okay, so let's take a look at SVD differentiation. Oh, let me make it bigger. So first of all, what, what do I actually mean by X, right? So SVD, you, you should remember by now. So SVD means that I have a matrix. Let's just consider a real matrix, M by N. And SVD finds matrix U, which is a square M by M matrix, matrix V, which is N by N, and D, which is M by N, and such that the D is diagonal, and both U and V are orthonormal. So what that means, that means that UTU is identity and VTV is also identity, right? And these three matrices satisfy that A equals U, D, V transpose. That's single value decomposition, which you should be familiar with because we used it quite a few times. Maybe the focus is not ideal, let me see. Better? So the SVD theorem says that for any completely arbitrary matrix, rectangular, can be single or can be whatever, I can find these three matrices U, V, and D such that this is satisfied. Now in general, these matrices are not defined uniquely, U, D, and V. So there can be uh, multiple solutions. But let's, and we, we discussed that before, right? So let's assume we have now de dealt with the ambiguity that we have a convention to pick the matrices U, D, and V in a unique way. Let's just assume to simplify our following discussion a little bit. Let's, let's assume that has been done. So uh, it works for completely arbitrary matrices, but we'll be mostly concerned about three by three matrices because that's what, uh, that's what uh, occurs in physics based most uh, frequently. Like for example, deformation gradient, right? That's where we were computing SVD quite a lot. And the first or one of the cases where this comes up, SVD differentiation, is if you want to do implicit integration for a corrotated elasticity, as we discussed in finite element method. Okay, so what do I mean by differentiating SVD? So for every matrix A, U, D, and V exist, and we assume that we pick the convention so that they also exist uniquely. So that means that the U, D, and V can all be understood essentially as functions of A, right? Because for a different input A matrix, and you can, we can now just think about three by three matrices, I get, little, I get, I get some U, D, and V matrices. So, you, so these, the factors can be seen as functions of the input matrix, right? After assuming, assuming uniqueness, assuming So now, what is, what is the question of differentiating SVD? The question is basically, if I have some matrix A, some deformation gradient, and I perturb it just a little bit, I just add a, a little, bit, little bit of a displacement, how does the U, D, and V matrices change due to that perturbation, right? That's intuitively what derivative means. That's what differentiation means, right? So in other words, I, want to, I, I need to also find out how sensitive the U, D, and Vs are to changes in, in individual components of A. Does that make sense? So the question is how to compute the derivatives of these, U, of these functions U, D, and V with respect to A. So the first thing that can look a little bit down thing if I just write it like this, what type of an object this is, right? So the U, for example, let's look at the U function. The U function is a function from three by three matrices to three by three matrices, right? It consumes an A matrix, which I assume is three by three, and it produces a U matrix, which is also three by three, and, in this, and, and also orthonormal. So this, the derivative of U by A is technically speaking a three by three by three by three tensor. 
but uh, with the with the concept of differentials, we can actually avoid the. We, we could, um, for most parts, we can avoid dealing with these tensors directly, so we don't have to worry that much about this. So yeah, so if u and similarly d and v are functions like this, then the question is how can we differentiate them? So the problem is that we don't really have any explicit formula, right, which would tell us how how to compute u based on a, right? That there's, we have algorithms for SVD, but they don't really give us like a formula, like like an analytical expression, closed form expression. It's an algorithm. So symbolic differentiation is not going to help us, right? Normally, if you have some sort of, no matter how complicated formula you have, you can always subject it to symbolic differentiation, feed it to MATLAB or, uh, sorry, Maple or Mathematica and that computes derivatives for you. Well, not in this case, right? Because we don't really have this formula to begin with, right? We, ha we have this algorithm that computes it, that's fine, but we don't really have an expression we could differentiate symbolically. So how can we deal with this? So that's one complication that's here. And the other complication is that we are dealing with functions of matrices, which sort of complicate things a little bit with this like tensorial type of stuff. So there are basically two groups of people. One group says that this is a relatively easy thing to do because computing derivatives is relatively easy. And the other group of people would tell you that this is a relatively impossible thing to do. <laughs> and right now it looks like it's almost impossible because I don't even have an expression, so how, how to differentiate it, right? And today I would like to convince you from the almost impossible to almost easy <laughs> mindset. So the the tool to deal with the first problem, the problem that we don't really have an explicit formula for the u, d, and v functions, is called implicit differentiation. So have you uh, seen implicit function theorem in some sort of calculus class or something like that? Anybody? Nobody? Maybe that's good because we, we had it when I was in college and I remember, all I remember was that it was really complicated and had like a lot of corner cases and ended up being one of the most complicated theorems because the mathematics around it is pretty hairy. But the idea is very simple. So let me give you the idea. So let's assume I have a function, 2D function, so f is a function from R2 to R. And it's a function, very simple, looks like, well, relatively simple, looks like this, right? So if I look at the zero level set, if I look at the set of points, I, I guess I could make it more formal like this, set of points such that this function is zero, and this will create probably some curve, right? It doesn't have to be well-defined curve, maybe there are some branches and so on, but clearly it will be like a one-dimensional thing, right? I, d I don't have an idea how this thing looks like, but I can immediately see that, for example, for x, equals zero and y equal one, this is satisfied, right? Because if I plug x zero here, I get zero. If I plug in one for y, I get one minus one, so it's zero. So this point is on the curve. So if I like draw a little graph, I know that my point zero one here, that's one point on the curve, right? Let's, uh, let's imagine that for some reason, I'm really interested in what, what, what this curve this curve looks like in the vicinity of this point, in the small neighborhood here. Because it could, look, it could look like something like this, right? It could look like, it could be flat, it could be going down, it could be, going, it could be, it could be going anywhere, and I want to find out where locally does this curve go. I have a little bit of a problem that's why the mathematics gets funny if the function wanted to go this way. Because in this way, if I look at it as a function, so if this is my x-axis and this is my y-axis, if I looked at it as a function, if the function wanted to go straight up, that would mean it has derivative infinity, right? And that's, that's, a, that's a bit of a problem. Another problem could be if like the function decided to branch here, right? If it was something, some bifurcation like this to be another problem. 
So that's that's why the mathematics around it gets gets a little bit hairy. But we are not not so much interested in these corner cases as opposed to the general case where the function is actually well defined in the small neighborhood of of my given point. So that's that's the case here. And in this case, I can express this curve as a function y of x, right? At least locally, I can write this as a function. So if this is my x-axis, this is my y-axis, I can write y equals something on x, right? y of x, a function, okay? Now the problem is if I wanted to do that, if I just said, okay, let's just try it, right? Let's just say this is zero, and now, now I want to like find out, now I want to solve for y for given x, right? I can put the x here, that's not a problem. But then how do you solve for y, right? On the left-hand side, I have five degree polynomial. So in general, these polynomials don't have analytic expressions for their roots. So we cannot find an analytic formula in general. So I don't know how to write it explicitly as a function that y would be, I don't know, like square root something, sine, blah, blah, blah of x. This, I don't know. Nevertheless, thanks to implicit functions theorem, thanks to implicit differentiation, I can actually compute the derivative of that function at this point zero one and at many other points. And that's, that's the key thing. That's, that's, that's also the trick which we use to differentiate SVD, which is, is the same story, right? I have, I have, it I have the implicit uh, expression of what it is. I don't have the explicit formula for that. So how do I do it in this case? Well, I just differentiate it, right? So if I imagine that the function y of x exists locally in the neighborhood of one zero, then I can just take this and differ differentiate the entire thing, right? So this is, I just write it again, just to make it super clear. So this is my implicit function. And if I differentiate it, well, what do I get? I get this. and x differentiates just to one, right? And from this, I can solve for the derivative five, like this, right? So here, all of a sudden, I have an expression, right? So what is it, what is the derivative at, at this point, zero, one? Well, I just plug in one here, right? So the derivative at zero will be one over five minus one, which is one over four, 0 0.25. So now I know, with, without actually knowing an explicit form for the function yx, now I know that at this point, this function locally, so this is one, this is one, so here it will gain one quarter so locally, the function looks like this here, which is pretty cool, I think. This is what the implicit functions theorem implicit differentiation essentially tells us. There is a different way to write this. Uh, maybe you are more familiar with that, with that notation. I can also differentiate it. It's like, let's take, oh no, let's take this. I can also differentiate it like this. I can do 5i4 dy or you know what, let me call it delta y to make it consistent with the i4 delta y minus delta y minus delta x equals zero. So it's basically different formalism for uh, computing derivatives. Computing derivatives really is just about the formalism. The mathematics there is, believe it or not, simple. What is not simple is to organize it, do, do, do all the formalities, all, all the red tape, do, do that right, so you can get manageable expressions. So here, uh, what, what do I mean by these deltas? These del deltas are exactly the differentials we have discussed before, but we haven't really formalized them, Pro we probably have not formalized them enough. So formally, what these differentials are, they are linear functions. And that's it. So this equality is an equality of linear functions, really. So the picture to keep in mind, to make it a little more palatable, um, 
if I have a function which I'm differentiating, some sort of funny function which I'm differentiating, let's say I'm differentiating it here, then the differential at this point, at every point, so let's say this is some point A, the differential at this point is the locally best linear approximation to that function. So this is my, this is function f, this is differential of f at point A. Okay, so the differentials you can see, this is really just a straight line, linear function, that's what it is. You might be thinking, what is the differential of x, where x is the actual independent variable? Like here, y is the function of x, right? That's the idea. But x is the independent variable. So what do you think is differential of x? It's the simplest possible linear function you can imagine. So what is that? One as a constant one actually would not be a linear function, right? Linear function has to have the property that at zero it gives it gives you zero, right? So linear functions, so one D linear functions have to look like this, right? It has to has to go through zero here. So this is a linear function. This is you could say zero, right? That would be a valid linear function. So I guess the second simplest linear function you can imagine. <laughs> the identity, right? That's this one. Fx equals x. Whatever it gets, the same thing it returns. That's the identity, right? And that's my delta x here, or the differential of x. That's the identity. And the differential of y, it, it, means, it means at a specific chosen point. This is, the notation doesn't really capture that, but I always mean I, I pick some point, and the differential relates to that the differential is for for the given point because if i pick of course if i have a function if i pick a different point i get a different differential right so the notation does not explicitly i guess if i wanted to be really pedantic i could do something like like this where the a is the point where that's being computed so why i am uh confusing things with these differentials as opposed to sticking with the probably more basic notation is that this is the way that will generalize naturally to matrices. So that's, that's what we will use to differentiate SVD. But because I see you are still a little bit confused about the differentials and there's nothing to be ashamed of. Oh, I, get, I get easily confused too. Let me give you a 2D example because the 1D examples might be like decept deceptively simple. So if I have a function from R2 to R, that's the next more complicated function, right? Just like a height field, we have, we have uh, discussed that quite a few times. And let's say I am quite interested in the neighborhood of point X0 and Y0, right? That there is some, some interesting point there. I want to study how the function locally behaves near this point, right? So you know that I can write, I can write this. So up to first order, I can just do Taylor expansion, right? We have done this in this course many times, so that should not come as a surprise. And here, what I put here is the differential AB. So this approximately equal means to up to first order accuracy. This means this is the value of the function exactly as x0 and y0. And this says that if I, oh sorry, this was supposed to be B. It says that if I, if I, if I, if I get, give it some displacements a and b, presumably small, but it works for any a and b, except that far away it won't be so accurate, then I can compute the, the linear approximation like this, where this delta is exactly the differential. If I want it to be pedantic again, then I would say it's delta f evaluated at point x0, y0, bit displacements a, b. But that's like a little bit too pedantic notation, so usually you, you see just this. You just omit the point where it's being evaluated, even though it, of course, matters, right? So in this case, what is the differential? What is the differential in the 2D case? It's also a linear function, right? This time a 2D linear function. So how, how does it look like intuitively? If I have like plane, I have height field, what types of height fields are linear functions? They have to pass through zero, right? At zero, linear function at zero always must be zero. No way around it. 
but then they are just basically planes with our arbitrary tilt. That, that's, that's what they are. And mathematically, I can just write it like this. So this is the partial derivative of f with respect to x times a plus the partial with respect to y times b. So these are just scalars. This is a scalar. This is a scalar. This tells me the slope of the plane in the x-axis, the slope of the plane in the y-axis, and the a and b are the displacements I give it, right? In the 1D case, the displacement, let, let me make another graph, a function like this. Let's say I want to compute the differential here. The, the differential is a linear approximation. It's, it's global. It, you, can you can imagine it approximates the function everywhere, but the approximation is only good when you are only guaranteed to be good when you are close to the point. So my point, I guess here I should say x0 to be consistent. If I'm close to my x0, then this uh, linear approximation is close to the original function. If I go further away, then I cannot in general expect that it will be good approximation. Okay. So the row, ah, that's, this is what I wanted to say. I wanted to say that this row of a and b, so in this case I have just a, so if I give it a like two, then this linear function will give me some approximation, this will give me some approximation of the original nonlinear function, right? And for small a's, for a's going to zero and b's going to zero if I'm in 2D, then I will be getting something that's pretty close to the function I'm, I'm looking at. Does that make sense? Uh, specifically, what is interesting, if I choose a to be 1 and b to be 0, what do I get? What the differential tells me? It's like stupid simple from, from this, but it's good to mention it. Because again, we will, make, we, will do, we will do this again in the case of matrices where it's not as simple. Uh, So if I give it a1 and b0, I get exactly the first partial, right? I, the differential reduces just to the partial derivative of f with respect to x, right? If I give it a0 and b1, I get the second partial derivative, right? So this is, this is important to keep in mind that probing the differential reveals the partial derivatives. So that's, this is another way how you can interpret the differential. The differential, or sometimes called total differential or total derivative, it is something that captures all the partial, partial derivatives together. Linear mapping that is informed about all the partial derivatives. Okay. So next, how do we apply this to differentiating SVD? So the nice thing about differentials is that the standard standard rules of calculus work for them. So for uh, specifically the product rule works for differentials, right? So this is how the SVD works, where now I understand that u, d, and v are functions of a, where a is the independent parameter, that's, that's my input, and the u, d, and v, they depend on it, because that's how the SVD function works, right? You give it a and it produces u, d, and v. So because differentials observe the product rule, then I can write that the differential of A is the differential of U dVt plus U differential of D V T plus U D and the differential of V transpose. Okay. Now what are these differential of A, differential of U, differential of D, differential of V? That's exactly the same idea which I was just illustrating. Except that here it's a little bit more complicated because as I said before, the u, u is a function like this from three by three matrices to three by three matrices, right? The same for d and v, same thing. And that's arbitrary nonlinear function. <coughs> so the delta u is the function with the same type, differential of u except that it's linear. Now it becomes linear function. So it's a local linearization of the u function. And again, that's 
keep in mind it's always for a chosen point where I'm evaluating it, right? For a given A, there's some, some now I assume, uniquely defined UDV. So that's the point I'm looking at. So the, all these differentials are with respect to that point, with respect to chosen A. Okay. So this, so for example, the differential of U, what, what, what does it do? I give it some sort of probe displacement, the same, of, the same type of probe displacement and this A and Bs. And it tells me what is the approximate change in U as a result of applying this displacement to A. Okay. Now what is the differential of A? That's of course also a linear function from three by three matrices to three by three matrices. And can someone tell me a linear? And what is it in this case? Someone <coughs> dare to suggest what is the differential <coughs> of A? It's again the, the, the simplest or the second simplest possible thing, right? It's the identity, right? So this means that if I, if I give it some displacement, I'm interested in this return, the displacement itself, right? What is the displacement? The displacement is my three by three matrix. Presumably it should be something small. So because only for small displacements, the differential is accurate approximation. But in theory, it works for arbitrarily large displacements. So this is, this is linear and, and we can say more, it's identity. Okay. So how do I interpret this formula, which follows from the product rule of differentials? This is essentially, uh, this is equivalence between linear functions, right? Because what I have on the left is a linear function identity. This is linear function. This D and V, uh, as long as this equality is concerned, they are constant. This basically means, so this, this whole thing will be also a linear function which works like this. It takes some parameter, delta u computes whatever it computes, and then I multiply it with d and vt, right? And this whole thing then becomes a linear function. And this thing says that if I sum these three linear functions, I get this, I get the identity, okay? So the one way you can easily uh, wrap your head around this is by assuming that somebody already gave you a probe displacement. For example, a nice one would be like this. One, zero, 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 right? That's sort of the analog of what I was doing here. If I give it one and zero, then I get the simple thing, then, then I get the partial derivative. So here, I also get essentially a partial derivative, right? This would be one, one good example. Another one would be, guess what? Zero, one, zero, 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 zero and so on, right? I have nine choices. I can put the one anywhere. And if I probe it with all these displacements, I capture the entire information about the differentials, about all the differentials. Okay, because it's a, it's a, all of them are linear functions. So I get a complete understanding of a linear function by describing its action on basis vectors, right? And the basis vectors or basis matrices, whatever we want to call it, for three by three matrices, they look like this, right? In general, I could write it as EI, EJ transpose, where those are standard basis vectors. That's just a fancy way to denote all these nine matrices. But I, I think it's clear what this means, right? So let's assume that somebody gave us one of these displacements, okay? For, for example, this one. In that case, the delta A, what will the delta A be? If, 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 I, if I have the displacement fixed, then the delta A is identity, right? So it just returns the displacement itself. So it returns the matrix. So this delta A becomes a three by three matrix, okay? In the same way, delta U, delta D, and delta V also become just a three by three matrices. So the moment the displacement is fixed, then this is a simple equality of three by three matrices, okay? The, the linear transformations go away and you can think about it just, just as regular, these things become just regular matrices. Not, no funny business there. Just three by three matrices, okay? For a fixed displacement. 
but you can always think about it as that somebody fixed the displacement. So it essentially doesn't matter. But I guess the easiest way to think about it is assume that you are like constructing that you assume that you are constructing like a C function, right? Like like differential of u, which tells you the dis which which you have the displacement as a parameter. So the displacement is given to you. So we know what the delta A is, and it's a three by three matrix. So you know, let me make it simple. Let's just assume it's this, okay? So in this case, this is just this is just this. That's this three by three matrix. And what do we need to do? We need to solve for the delta U, delta D, and delta V, right? We so we have already computed the SVD of A, so we already know what the U, D, and V matrices are, right? We also know what the delta A matrix is because that's whatever displacement we chose, for example, the first one, okay? So all we need to do to finish computing derivatives of SVD is to solve this matrix equality for delta U, delta D, and delta V. And I will show you next how to do it. That's not, not so difficult. Does that make some sense? Okay, so how do I solve this? Well, what I can do, I can hit it from the left with UT and from the right with V. Because if I do this, then I will get here what? I will get here UT delta U DVT plus, so here UTU annihilates itself, right? That's identity because U is orthonormal. So this will become delta D. Here from the right, I'm multiplying it to, to, to so sorry this was supposed to go away because I multiplied from the right with V so VT V also identity right so here from the left with UT from the right with V so this leaves me just a differential of D naked essentially U uh, I'm doing this again so UTU is identity this gives me D delta VT V okay let me write this again because I made all these stupid mistakes. I just rewrote it without mistakes. And what you can notice about this is that this is equivalent to V transpose delta V, the whole thing transposed. Again, differential is, is linear, so it doesn't matter if I first transpose it, then differentiate, or the other way around, it doesn't, doesn't matter. And clearly, if I transpose this whole thing, I, I get this, right? That's to make it sort of in the same format as this guy here. And mind you, what we are solving for, we, we know, we know u, we know delta a, we know b, we know d, what we are solving for is delta U, delta D, and delta V. That's what we need to solve for, okay? Now these things, the UT delta U and the VT delta V, they have an, a very interesting property, which we have slightly touched when we were talking about rigid body physics. Does somebody dare to attempt to guess? What is, so UT, so first of all, what is the type of UT delta U? That's a simple question. It's a matrix, right? It's a three by three matrix, UT delta U. Because delta U, now we assumed we fixed the displacement, so this delta U is nothing but a three by three matrix. That's that's how you can make it really simple. For, forget, forget, you can even forget about the differentials if you want. Just the matrix, okay? So UT delta U is also a three by three matrix. It's a special type of three by three matrix, however. Can somebody make the connection to rigid body kinematics? And we encounter the same thing. So here is, what, let's see if you get it during the course of the derivation, right? So we know that U, T, U is identity because U is orthonormal, right? So that means if I compute the differential of U, T, U, I get zero, right? Because I identity is constant, differentiating gives me zero, right? 
because of the product rule, I have the differential u t u plus the differential of u, t, I guess like this, right? Plus the differential, oh God damn it. Differential of u t u plus u t, the differential of u is zero, right? I just applied the product rule on this. And this is what I got. And this may be recognized because we have seen this before. In particular, this you can rewrite as u t delta u, the whole thing transposed, right? That's the same trick, same trick as here. If I transpose this, I get back to this, right? So that's fine. But this thing is the same as this thing, right? So that, that means that u t delta u is equal to minus its transpose, u t delta u transpose, which means that u t delta u is what type of matrix? Exactly, anti-symmetric or skew-symmetric, right? If I transpose it, I get minus the same matrix. So now tell me where, where have we seen it in rigid body kinematics? What rigid body thing was born out of this observation? So uh, let me write, okay, so, um, yeah. You can, you can guess, that's fine. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's because, let me remind you, you know what, I will I will denote this as u tilde, this, so I don't have to write u t delta u all the time, let's just call this u tilde, why not? And then this matrix, because it's anti-symmetric, it must have zeros on the diagonal, right? That's the only number that is equal to its own uh, negation. And here is some u1 thing, some scalar u1, u2 tilde, u3 tilde, and here it have to be the, the opposite ones. Minus u3 tilde, okay? So this is my u tilde matrix, a general three by three anti-symmetric matrix, right? Most important, this has three degrees of freedom, u1, u2, u3, let tilde us. And this is also how angular, exactly as you said, how, that's how angular velocity, how we derived angular velocity. So for Vt delta V, I could, I could write the exact same thing, right? For Vt delta V is also anti-symmetric. It's exactly the same argument, also anti-symmetric. Right? So also just three degrees of freedom. Some V1 tilde, V2 tilde, V3 tilde, four for the V. So we can say that this is V tilde thing. V tilde is V transpose delta V, okay? Now what is delta D? So I said it's again just a, th a three by three matrix, but of course remember that the D was diagonal Right, so the differential, of course, is also just a diagonal matrix. If there were zeros, you couldn't get any non-zero by an accident or something. So the delta D also has just three degrees of freedom. Right, and that that's nice because this is this is an equality between three by three matrices. So that means it is a nine equalities altogether. Right. And on the right hand side, we have exactly nine degrees of freedom. So that's ni that nicely adds up, that, that looks like we will be able to solve it, which, which we will. So the easiest thing to solve for is the delta D, right? So again, mind you where, where we are. We know the delta A, we know U, we know V, we know D. What we are solving for is delta U, delta D, and delta V. And we will be solving for, we introduce the substitution, the substitution that U tilde is U T delta U and V tilde is V T delta V. So now we will solve for the delta Ds, the D11, D22, D3, D3, three things, and the U tilde's and V tilde's. And from this, we figure out what are the, what are the delta U, delta v, D, and delta V matrices, and we'll be done. We will have the derivatives of SVD. So first computing the differential of D, that is actually simple. 
Why is that simple? Well, let's let's take a look at this equation, right? So the left hand side is a known constant matrix. That's something we know what this is, right? Because this delta A, that, that's something we fix. That's something we assume we know. This is a skew symmetric matrix. That's this is this matrix, right? That's sort of cool. I can do two handed. So if I multiply it with D, where D, D is a diagonal, right? So what, what do I get? Let me try to squeeze it in here. So if I do U tilde D, <laughs> I need to denote it different. You know what, okay, let's, let's give these tildes too. So it's sort of compatible. So if the original D was without tildes, then what I will get here is this. D1, 1, U1, D1, 1, U2, D2, 2, U1, 0, D3, 3, U2, D3, 3, U3, and 0. Right? Because the D was a diagonal matrix of D11, D22, D3, 3, right? So this is my U tilde D. This thing is U tilde D. You know what? Let me do it on another paper. I'm running out of space. So, what we are solving is this equation where we have this U tilde D plus the differential of D plus. D V tilde transpose. And we have just established that this U tilde D is a matrix that has zeros here and some non zeros elsewhere, right? By, by exactly the same argument, we can see that the same is true for this matrix. It has zeros on the diagonal and some non zeros the non-zeros as stars of diagonal. Okay. And the delta D is a diagonal matrix. So because we know this, solving for delta or computing delta D is trivial, right? We just look at the diagonal here and aha, uh -huh, that's, that's delta D, right? Done. That's really as, as simple as that. So all we, need, all we need to do is pick a displacement, delta A, compute the SVD, so we have the U and V matrices, and immediately we have the derivatives, the, or the differential or the partial derivatives of the single values. That's what's in the D matrix, okay? Now, how do we get the remaining ones? How do we solve for the rest? So we already have, we already know what is in here. Ah, so I guess I need to write it more carefully. So UD was this. This was 0, D2, U1, D3, U2. Minus D1, U1, 0, D3, U3, minus D1, U2, minus D2, U3, and 0. Now, what do I have in D, V, transposed? So that's, so the V transpose sorry, B tilde transpose looks like this, so that oh, let's just call it like this B1, B2, B3 with zeros here, minus B1 minus v2, minus v3, and zero. 
So if I multiply it with the diagonal matrix from the left, now the diagonal matrix will be multiplying the rows as opposed to columns, right? Here the diagonal matrix happen to be acting on the columns. Here we'll be multiplying the rows. So what I will get here will be D1, B1 tilde, D1, B2 tilde, minus D2, V1 tilde, zero, and D2, V3, minus D3, V2 tilde, D3 again, and whatever was there before. <coughs> so here the first uh, row got multiplied by D1, second row, and third row, okay? Now the diagonal, that's already out of it, right? Whatever is on the diagonal is still is on the diagonal. So what we need to solve, what, what remains to be solved for are these U's and V's here. So let's take a look at the first one, the U1 and V1, right? So these things, these things get summed together, right? As, as implied by this matrix equation. So I, I know this is, this is a known matrix by now, right? This, this, this I know. What I don't know, and I also know it is delta Ds now, they, they, they already don't matter, but I need to solve for are the Vs. So on, on, this, on this element, at row one, column two, what do I get? I get D2, U1 tilde, plus D1, V1 tilde, equals some M1, that's what, whatever coefficient was in this matrix, that's what I know, right? And here I have minus D1, U1 tilde, minus D2, V1 tilde, and that's sum M2, right? That's, again, whatever was in this matrix on the left-hand side, okay? So this is uh, nothing but the system of two by two linear equations. I can also write it like this. I can write it as U1 with tildes V1, This will have D2, D1, minus D1, minus D2, right? And that's supposed to be equal to M1 and M2, right? And this is a system, very trivial system, which I can immediately solve for U1 tilde and V1 tilde, right? That's how I get U1 and V1 tildes. For U2, and V2, exactly the same story. Again, I just invert the two by two matrix and solve it. And for U3 and V3, again, the same thing. So that's, that's how I solve for U tilde and V tilde. And how do I get my desired differentials? Well, you remember that I used the substitution. I said that U tilde is UT delta U, right? And I said that V tilde is VT delta V. <coughs> So now I have computed, I have already solved for U tilde and V tilde by, do, by doing this, by solving the two by two systems. And once I have them, all I need to do is do the U transpose U tilde and that reveals the differential of U. And the same way VT, V tilde, oh no, V, V tilde gives me the differential of me. And that's basically it. So for a given displacement, delta A, you know how to compute the displacements in delta U, delta D, and delta V. So intuitively, you can think about it this way. If you perturb, if you displace the input matrix A by delta A, the approximate perturbance, the approximate change in the U, D, and V factors in SVD is approximately the delta U, delta D, and delta V approximately means up to first order accuracy in the neighborhood of my point. So meaning if delta A is something small, something close to zero matrix, then you can expect a good, good accuracy out of it. It's just the same idea as, as, as the Okay. So that's, that's basically it. <laughs> computing the derivatives of SVD. Do you have any questions? <laughs> yeah. What is it? Like what generates it is the application. Right, so where, th where this comes up typically in phys based papers is if you want to, so if you are doing correlated elasticity, 
vol volumetric elasticity doing the coordinated model, and you want to do implicit integration. So you need to compute the first and second derivatives of the coordinated elastic energy, right? So the first derivative is fine; that doesn't need to you doesn't need the derivative of SVD. But then the second derivative, you need exactly this to compute the Hessian of the energy due to coordinated elasticity you need the derivatives of SVD. And it has other applications. I have seen some computer vision applications, which I don't remember what exactly it was. In general, I think it's probably occurring quite quite commonly, right? Because if you have, it's basic, yeah, it's basically answering the basic question, like if my matrix changes by a little bit, by how much do the U, V, and D factors change? Right. That's exactly what you need to do in implicit uh, integration. We, we have done it already for mass spring systems, right? And this is basically how you can do it for uh, coordinated elasticity volumetrically. So where this came up with why, why I chose to cover this is because this also appears in the snow paper, the popular Disney snow paper, which everybody wants to be implementing, even though it's pretty, pretty difficult. <laughs> That's about the snow simulation they used in Frozen. So, and then there they are using the same thing. The problem with this is that, again, people either think it's trivial and they like don't mention it at all or mention it like few sentences at the end of the paper, or they think it's like impossible, so they don't even talk about it. So it's pretty difficult to find like a detailed explanation, really just, I, I, I believe that you, you could go ahead and implement this based on this explanation. I don't think you can go ahead and implement it based on the explanation that's available in the original paper because that it, it like gives you like three sentences with like all sorts of differentials and go figure out how to actually compute it. Okay, so maybe you will find this useful at some point. <laughs> okay, so that's, yeah, so I guess that's that's it for the course, unless you have some other questions. I'm also happy to discuss the final projects, you, you, especially those of you that I, I was chosen to be your mentor. <laughs> okay, if not, then we'll just consider it a course. <laughs> I'll stop the recording here, and we can still discuss afterwards because we still have a little bit of time. <laughs>